All right, let's talk about physical attractiveness or what makes people physically attractive. You're probably familiar with the idea that people have their own individual tastes, but research has shown us that there are certain features that seem to be universally or commonly attractive to human beings. Um, and so evolutionary psychologists, they will propose that if certain traits are considered universally attractive, then they are, they are based in ancient inherited instincts. And this is one of those things, like many things from evolutionary psychology. Uh, these are ideas that we can't necessarily empirically, empirically validate, you know, without a time machine where we can go back and watch everything happen over time. Uh, so uh, let's talk about uh, some of the features. All right. So the idea here is we may all agree that certain features are attractive, but we don't necessarily know that we are noticing those features, that we pick up on them uh, in sort of an automatic or unconscious manner. All right, so one of these things is symmetry. With faces, we like faces that have symmetry. I always remember that, um, you know, I didn't like uh, hearing those findings when, I, you know, like when I was in college, uh, and they'd say, okay, so, you know, symmetric faces are good, and, you know, me and my friends, we were all, like, looking at her face, like, is my face symmetric? And I'm like, oh, wait, and you may, you, you may have seen, like, the social media trend where people take one side of their face, one half of their face, and they, 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 they do a mirror image with the other side of the face, and what they see is you get a completely different face when you have one side versus the other, so nobody really has, like, a truly symmetric face but we don't like vast changes in symmetry and in particular we're interested in bilateral symmetry so one side to the other that's the left half perfectly or near perfectly matching the right half several studies have supported that people find faces that have bilateral symmetry that we find them to be attractive uh, and so um, for both sexes, for males and females, greater body symmetry was associated with a higher number of sex partners. Now you can probably anticipate, this is not the only thing that's ever been correlated with attractiveness or the number of sex partners you have. This is just, you know, one thing, the one, one, one factor that we add to the big picture, you know, larger pool of findings. And, um, Symmetry is one of those things you can pick up on, you can notice it easily. So remember way back when we were talking about heuristics, we were talking about things like social cognition and how, how we think about other people or how we think about social situations? Symmetry might be one of these heuristic, uh, heuristic features, something that gives us a quick hint into what? What does it give us a hint into? It might give us a hint into genetic quality uh, because uh, certain, um, certain defects or disorders or general atypicalities in genetic inheritance can lead to faces that lack symmetry. I often don't like this particular idea because, and like many human beings, we don't like to think of ourselves as looking for romantic partners that have good genes. You know, that just, that reminds us of other things that just kind of, it, it doesn't sound right. But this is one of the explanations that evolutionary psychologists have proposed. Now, um, we also see differences in people who are sober versus intoxicated, inebriated. Sober people are good at detecting symmetry in faces and find them less attractive. Sorry, asymmetry. I said symmetry, didn't I? Asymmetry. They are good at detecting asymmetry in faces and find them less attractive. Drunk people cannot even tell when faces are asymmetrical. All right, folks. There is this term out there that I don't particularly like because it often gets thrown out there and language and descriptions that are kind of misogynist or sexist in nature but you know the beer goggles effect you know, the idea that drinking will make pe make people look more hot than they actually are and then you go and hook up because you do impulsive things when you're drunk i'm sure we've learned that before 
alcohol takes away your filter. We talked about that in the aggression chapter, didn't we? We did. So, you know, you hook up and then later you're like, whoa, whoa, how did I not notice this person is not so attractive? It was the alcohol perhaps interferes with your ability to, ability to detect certain features, and in one case, asymmetry. There's more to it than that. We know there's more to it than that. But there's some evidence for our preference for symmetry, in particular bilateral symmetry. Now, another set of findings that we have is, let's talk about average faces. Now, what do we mean by average? You mean just like plain? Well, like a statistical average. Take a bunch of facial, facial features and find the most average, typical face you can make. So composite or average faces. They take a bunch of, like they take a, a bunch of pictures and they take features from those pictures, but you know, like average eye size, average distance between the eyes, average nose size, things like that. And they try to create a composite, a, a puzzle piece sort of face that's average, as average as possible. And the idea is that they don't contain any unusual or strange features. The, you don't have any features that stand out as being particularly out of the ordinary. They don't, you know, if you look at statistical means for things like lip size or something, they're going to be in the, the average range. And we find that people seem to like those faces. They like faces that are not too unusual. The computer-generated average face uh, is rated as the most beautiful compared to faces of real people, of actual people. Now, sometimes students will think that that's strange because they know, like if they've watched shows where people try to get into uh, modeling or something like that, they often will uh, uh, emphasize, you know, looking exotic, looking uh, unique and special in some way. But, you know, if you look at the faces of people who become successful models or other successful performers who are known for being attractive, they often don't have like really drastically unusual features. Uh, you know, you're not going to have a situation where someone has a nose that's way bigger or way smaller uh, than everybody else's, or their eyes are really super far apart. They, you know, maybe slightly, but not not drastically unusual. All right. Now, when we talk about this effect, sometimes they just criticize the methodology of the studies and other times we focus on how average faces may fit with cultural expectations. You know, you see a lot of folks who are average and so this fits with what you expect a face to look like. It doesn't, it doesn't violate or deviate from your expectations. Now, again, going back to that idea that sometimes we're looking for cues for genetic health genetic quality, genetic fitness, all these eugenic type terms. But anyway, all right, so uh, average faces and, sym and symmetry might be cues to genetic health and that's why they might, uh, they might seem appealing, they might seem attractive to us. Now, another um, element of attractiveness has to do with body features, all right? So faces are nice, we like faces. All right, there's a reason that the yearbook always has those face pictures in there or that you go on dating profiles, uh, like, you know, using dating apps and whatnot. There's a big old face, pi face picture, typically, maybe some body pictures in there of somebody. But, hey, we, got, we want to see your face. We want to see what your face looks like. A lot of people will recognize that faces are important. What about body features? Well, we also look at the ratio of certain body features to other body features. And we look at different features for males versus females. And um, one area where we've done research is the waist to hip ratio. All right, so how big is the waist? You can't see my waist because it's on, but you can, the, how big is someone's waist compared to how wide, how large their hips are? It's not the absolute size, it's in comparison to the other feature. All right, so, you know, you might have someone who actually has, uh, statistically, you know, in terms of comparison to the norms, they might have a wide waist, but compared to their hips, it may look different because of the size of their hips. Um, and so you have a ratio comparing the circumference of the waist to the circumference of the hips. And uh, so a 30-inch waist to 40-inch hips, 
that is a 3 to 4 ratio or a 0.75. All right, so is 0.75 good? Actually, it's a little higher than most people tend to prefer. The most desirable waist to hip ratio for women is a females, assigned female at birth women, is about 0.7. All right, so about a 0.7 ratio seems to be the sweet spot for most folks. Now, this is not to say that you have a bunch of people out there who are like, well, they have a waist ratio of 0.8. I can't date them. Remember all the other factors that we've talked about that contribute to attractiveness. Those can certainly rule out uh, any, any, of, any individual factor on its own is not going to determine on its own how attractive you find somebody. Now, for folks who are male. What do we look at for them? It's a little bit different, all right, because they have small, they have smaller hips, all right. For them, it's waist to shoulders, waist to shoulders ratio. Uh, so the circumference of the waist to the circumference of the shoulders, and the most attractive is about a three to four ratio, also. So focusing on the shoulders rather than the hips, but both of them are comparing in some way to the waist. So it's not the absolute width or size or circumference of the waist, it's comparison to this, this other body part. All right, so why do we care? What, why do we like, why do we focus on these features? From an evolutionary perspective, um, larger hips in women, maybe you're already anticipating it. You've heard the term birthing hips. I sure did growing up, you know, when I started to develop wide hips and people were like, well, you got good birthing hips. And I'm like, I'm 10. I don't want to think about birthing. Thank you very much. All right. Large hips in women suggest healthy gateway for babies. In other words, the pelvis is wide enough that you could probably have an uncomplicated delivery. Now, that is certainly not a guarantee. I, you know, I certainly do have friends who still had a complicated delivery, even with wide hips. But that's the general idea. So sort of this general cue that, hey, this person could handle having babies. And many of you of college age are probably not looking for romantic partners thinking, all right, which one of these could have my babies? But from an evolutionary perspective, since they focus on mating, uh, carrying on, uh, uh, passing on your genes, reproduction, you know, that makes sense that they would focus on that. Now, for, uh, and, and for men, a small waist, small weight indicates aerobic fitness, broad shoulders indicates physical strength, so they, you know, they could, they could protect, they protect, provide, you know, things like that that evolutionarily would have contributed to survival. All right, so good sampling of things that have to do with physical attractiveness. We also know that something called baby face features are generally considered attractive in many cultures. So what do I mean by baby face? What makes a face look babyish? Big round eyes, sort of a small mouth but with full lips, uh, having that smaller roundish face, small chin. All right, think, think of how baby, like if someone was going to draw a baby compared to an adult, how the proportions would look different. Also the features that make certain animals cute to us. And I read somewhere once where they said like the, the cutest animal uh, based on what we find attractive would be a panda. Attractive in terms of like you want to take care of it like a child is a panda because of the round eyes and other features that, that, that make it look, look babyish, right? I'm not saying we're all attracted to pandas, all right? But, you know, there, there is sort of that advantage that those baby face features, it's like you feel uh, warmth, nurturance, like I want to take care of that little baby, uh, or I just feel positive towards that. All right, so different features. A lot of them, you know, the thing with physical attractiveness, a lot of the stuff you can't control. Some of the other features you have, you know, a little bit more control over, like you know, like um, when we talk about things that contri con contribute to attraction, like similarity, you know, you choose what your interests and stuff like that are, and you can find people that also share those interests. But when you talk about things like physical attraction, it's like, well, this is what you got. <laughs> to a certain degree, you're just stuck with what you got. And it may be considered attractive, it may not, but let's remember attract, uh, physical attractiveness is not the only thing that is going to contribute to whether two people will become attracted to each other, either initially or eventually. All right, so 
next video, we are, I'm actually going to skip some things from the chapter and we are going to talk about, um, where is it? I'm trying to find the next, the next topic. We're going to talk about, you know, a few terms here and there. All right, there it is. All right.